Well, I got two phone calls before 8 o'clock this morning, but they were from the East, one of them was from Washington, D.C., and they have to do with discussions in class, Sunday school classes and priesthood quorums that took place yesterday, and they all have to do with this Adam and his having a body, and uh, the uh, idea here, this fellow says, uh, was Adam's sin really a sin, or was it a transgression? See, President Joseph F. Smith said that Adam's sin was a transgression rather than a sin. Well, there is a difference. He said there's no difference between, oh, yes, there is a great difference between them. You see, that's in our article of faith, our second article of faith. We believe that men should be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Once you stepped over the bound, there's something, a difference between being naughty and being vicious, you see, being rancorous. Uh, how far can you go? I mean, you say, Will you say, Macbeth, I've stepped in blood so far that return would be as tedious as Goror. I've sinned already, so I might as well go on sinning. That's what John Chrysostom preached. Sin all you can. Give God a chance to display his mercy and forgiving power. If you sin less than you can, you've robbed him of that privilege, you see. See how you can rationalize these things as far as that goes? But it's back to this idea of that we have in Third Nephi, this marvelous thing here. Let's see what we wrote. <laughs> I've been writing since fury all morning now as a result of this. Now, in the Christian world, Adam's fall was the sin, you see. It was vile. It was unspeakable. It brought death into the world and all our woes as men, as, as Milton tells us, with loss of Eden, till a greater one redeem us and so forth. It was everything nasty and vile that followed it. And they will tell us, the early fathers of the church tell us that it was matter and matter alone, substance, that was the defilement. That's what the Neoplatonists taught. That's what the, uh, oh, I shouldn't take this off. I only have one suspender. Uh, <laughs> you don't need more. It was what the Neoplatonists taught. It was what uh, the Gnostics taught. It was what the Hermetics taught. That all matter, as uh, Plotinus says, any contact with matter would corrupt God himself completely. See, that's how bad matter was. Where did they get this idea, this obsession, this Neoplatonic obsession, Alexandrian and so forth, that the Christian world adopted that matter was all bad? See, we're talking about Christ coming to the Nephites here. That matter it was all bad because it was in their world. They couldn't even think of existing without misbehaving. The world had become so nasty and corrupt and decayed as ours is becoming that we just equate the two. Having, mean, having a body means uh, being vile. You don't have to, you know. Uh, in, the, in the first, uh, most beautiful of all Christian hymns, The Pearl, a very early writing, The Pearl, the hero, leaves his happy family in heaven. He's in heaven. They all believed in the pre-existence in those days. Uh, he says, uh, when I was with my heavenly Father above, uh, he goes forth and he comes down he goes to Egypt to be tested. He has to get a pearl and bring it back. He has to bring it back undefiled. But when he goes to Egypt, the warning is, if you go to Egypt, you will be subject to defilement. You will be tempted all over. And he was, you see. But if you go to Egypt, you are lost, you see. Well, if you go to Egypt, the question arose in this, how far do you have to sink? That depends entirely on yourself, see, as far as that goes. So. What does the spirit lack? I mean, having a body, does that make it necessary for you to be utterly vile? That's become the idiom of our time. But what does spirit lack? I should start asking questions here. What does the spirit have? Uh, Brother Hart? Brother Hart amongst us? That's the way you go through the line. Insidious. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and uh, Brother Havens? What is spirit lacking? What do you have that you didn't have as a spirit? Exactly. Substance. That's what you have, you see. Uh, the spirit apparently doesn't have enough. Does the spirit have enough substance? Well, enough for what? Well, Brigham Young has a lot to say about that. Brigham Young is very good on that. A lot what? Are you saying that the spirit doesn't? You mean enough um, physical substance or enough substance? Per well, it's all physical. We're, we're getting, we get into our quantum physics, you see, and it's all forms of energy anyway, and there's no real substance there at all, except we know it does exist. We're, we're aware of it, you see, at various levels. Uh, and Joseph Smith absolutely shocked everybody when he said spirit is a more refined form of matter. We had spirit body. You don't just go around as a gas when you're a spirit, you see. The Christian world doesn't know how to handle that, you see. It has to be something like in Doctor Who, you have to be made out of, uh, of uh, uh, out of cellophane or something like that, you see, and shake a lot, and then that makes you a spirit, you see. No, they didn't know how to define spirit. 
uh, Oregon, remember, the first and greatest of all the Christian theologians, goes into this quite deeply. It says there's only one thing you can say about a spirit. It's a somaton. It has no matter, no body, no photons, no electrons, no neutrons, nothing in it at all. It is just pure idea and nothing else. The, great, uh, the most eminent Catholic uh, theologian in this country, in this century, uh, Etienne Giusson, writes a book on God, and his final definition of God is, God is the self-thinking thinker who thinks only of thought. So now you know what God is, you see. God is the self. The idea is get away from all matter. Don't have Christ coming down here eating with people and things like that. That's all wrong. You can't have that. Well, let's pursue that theme for a minute here. Uh, Brigham Young tells us that there are peculiar kinds of joy that you can experience here. We t we're told about appetites, desires, and passions. And uh, are they bad? Uh, that's Brother Haven, isn't it? Brother Hillam? Yeah. Brother Hillam? Are appetites, desires, and passions to be wiped out and, and ignored and denied and suppressed entirely? Um, What's the formula? They're to be kept within the. They're to be kept within the bounds that the Lord has set. But they're to be there, but be within the bounds the Lord has set. The idea is, you see, that we can have, as Brigham tells us, the, these are for our edification, for our enjoyment. We don't overdo them. Now. A good example of that is in the 19th Psalm. I looked at this verse and then I suddenly looked at the first verse and realized that this is anthropism of a high order. And this takes us right into the whole problem. This 19th Psalm is the one perhaps the people know best. Next to the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, this is the one I'm talking about here. He says, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Now, you rejoice to run a race. That's a physical experience. A strong man rejoices to run a race. And a bridegroom comes glowing. The word it uses is cease is the word. Comes glowing out of the bridal chamber. Perfectly legitimate pleasures that they couldn't have as spirits. You see, this is a very interesting point. So I turn to the 19th Psalm here. And notice how it starts out. This is right in this theme. It is cosmism. It deals with the, the cosmos and so forth. Aha. Hashmai misaprim. For they ail, the heavens, of course, the heaven, always in the plural. Misaparin, say fair, is a book. Sapper is to make known. Sipur is uh, to give an account or a story or lesson. See, they tell the story. They, they tell you the story. They'll tell you about the true nature of the kavod ail, of the greatness of God. Kavod means the weight, the heaviness, the greatness, the glory, the might of God. The, the heavens, the physical heavens, you see, you mustn't deny them. They proclaim or say, they announce to you that God is a very powerful and glorious being. Yeah. Uh, and the Ma'ase means the deeds, the performances of, of uh, Jehovah, Yehuda. And notice it used the word uh, Jehovah here. Ma'ase. Uh, Oh, yeah, of his hands, excuse me. And the man say of his hands, and say of his hands. And the, the workings of his hand may deem, explain, are clear before you if you, if you study them careful. Uh, ha Rekaim. Rekaim is the heavens that are, that is the, the other galaxies. That's the world beyond this world. He uses, he uses lots of astronomical terms in this one. So we all know the heavens declare the glory of God, and, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. But showeth forth, is, is, it explains. Magid goes far, farther than showeth forth. It means explains. Well, yom li yom yabiach. Every single day, day by day, yagiach. That word means uh, yagiach omer means to gush forth in a great flowing stream, overpowering stream, yuck, yuck. And this is simply, I think, this came in our, announces his Omer, his words, his commands, his plan for the thing. Omer is, is what he has uttered. The Logos, which is, Logos, the word of his mouth. Walayla, lalayla, and from day, to, from day to day, and then from night to night. Yahweh, there's another one. Yahweh means A gush forth air. Yahweh means to blow air. It means to blow hard. To uh, a powerful blowing wind. It means to an irresistible. is an irresistible course. Day after day, his utterances, his utterances gush forth. <laughs> it continued, continued creation. And night by night, Yahweh dahath. He, 
he blasts forth, that blast is the word, he blasts forth knowledge, you see. Makes pretty strong. Ain omer ein devar im lefi nishmach kolam. Yes. There is no omer, he used that word again and again. There is no teaching, no doctrine, no knowledge. Ain devarim, of course davar is it, there are no words, no formulas of word, and no, no statements. Beli nishmach kolam, whose voices are not heard without the hearing of their voices. It all comes out. So we're, we're being blasted with information, whether we know it or not. He's talking about it. The stars do send forth hints. We're able to, all we get from them is hints. We've been unable to react to them because we haven't. As, uh, as Hawking says here, we could have known all this as early as the time of Newton. All the, all the data was there we needed. But he said, we had another plan of the universe we were sticking to, and so we completely ignored it. That's what we do now. God is trying to teach us. Ain all members of the yes, or the the Kol Haaretz. Now Kol Haaretz is everywhere. The Kol Haaretz Yatsa Kom. Oh, this is an amazing verse. Yatsa Kom. Ubekatzat Ubekatzat Table. I don't have to point this. Ubekatzat Table. Malayhem Malayhem. The Shemesh. Yes, the Shemesh. Psalm. Ohel. Uh, and those are two different sentences, actually. The first one says, the call has, now everywhere, Yatsa goes forth, Como, his string, it says his string is extended everywhere. Now what on earth does that possibly mean? But the word here is Kom. That means the string of a music. Oh, hey, I've written this all out this morning. Let me go through here. What am I bothering about this for? Which is, as a bridegroom cometh out of a chamber and reach, oh, they come to the fifth one. Now, what rejoicing? This smacks of the anthropic principle. Man is not an observer, but a participator in the universe, we're told now, in which everything is immediately influenced by everything else, including himself. So we read the home psalm. The heavens declare forth the glory of God, and I see it, and I react to it, you see. It declares it to me. It's a personal message, it says. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night knowledge. Now, nabi'ah, day uttereth speech, means to gush forth in torrents, and night unto night, yichave, means to breathe out, to, blow, to blast out knowledge. You can't control it. And then, note, the, next, the second verse is on communication by speech, language, voice, and hearing. All those are mentioned in this verse here, where it says here, uh, it's the second verse there. The Yom Vilon, yes. Uh, oh, they're numbered differently in different editions here. Uh, this is on communication. Now, Arthur, Arthur Clark tells us that light and sound, their waves don't travel very far. They travel, but they have to be sorted out very soon. Unless we send a, a camera clear out to, to Neptune to take a photograph of the thing, we're not gonna, never going to see it in a telescope. The telescope can only dissolve up to a certain point because after sound waves or light waves have traveled a short distance, they dampen each other. They dampen. You're not going to get a clear image no matter how powerful an instrument you have. The conclusion is that there is only one way known so far by which information can be conveyed over vast reaches of time and place, and that is the written word. All you need for the written word is a surface to scratch on and something to scratch with, and you have something that can travel for millions of miles and can be taken millions of miles away and deliver your message, which will not only be time and place and so forth where you are, but what you think, you know, this is uh, Carl Sagan is, is hipped on this. He, he's trying to write things to send out into the galaxies and the like. But it, only the written word will, will convey, but not just uh, who you are, time and place in your name, but your most uh, inmost thoughts and feelings. Your most subtle emotions and nuances of experience and reaction and so forth. All that can be conveyed in writing over thousands of years. I'm reading a text now that's possibly terrifying, an Egyptian text that goes way back 5,000 years. And boy, what a description it is of, of a, a world gone bad way back then. But this is it, you see, in this, this verse, I can find the darn thing here. Uh, yes, Ain Omer, yes, Ain Omer. There is Omer, is Amar is to utter, to make a statement, to make a claim, to make a command. And then Wa'ain Devarim, and there is no formula or uniting or, or uh, putting together of words without Nishmag, Kulam, except they are all heard by someone. They must be heard by someone. And then uh, that's the fourth, and here is the second. 
Bilam. Bechol ha'aretz, and then he says, Bechol ha'aretz, and then the next verse says a funny thing. Their line is extended to all the earth. What's he talking about, their line? That's the way they translate it. It's not the thing at all. The word is kum, which is the ko, cow, which is the string of a musical instrument. And here's what we say here with great wisdom. Uh, cow is the string of a musical instrument. This refers to the music of the spheres. You've all heard of that. It was the string of an instrument, the top Pythagoras, that the principles of mathematics, which have been developed ever since as the key to understanding the structure of the universe, the way he discovered it was by plucking a key, uh, was by plucking a string, and finding that if he took half the string, it was the same note, only twice as high, and so forth. Then he suddenly found that the whole thing was laid out on a mathematical order. And there are seven notes to the scale. The eighth is the repetition of the other one, you see. And there are the seven spheres that go around the sun. The seven spheres, the seven heavens. Each has its tone, and as they go around, they make harmony together, each, each making its note. And with that combination of harmony, there's an infinite number of harmonies and combinations that you can make. Uh, if you had, uh, well, some of the... You can, you can figure out the factorials, how much it would take, how many uh, combinations of notes you can make with eight notes, and they go on to billions and billions and billions. The song never ends. So this is talking about that. And it makes absolutely no sense in the King James Version. His, his line is stretched. His line is stretched in the earth. And it says, what it says here, through all the earth, through all the universe, through all the universe, his, uh, his string is stretched, you see. Ubekitzath, Hevel, and to the ends of... Now, Hevel is this earth. The planet earth is Hevel, whereas Yaretz, Aretz is a sweeping term that means everything. Kolar, I mean, just the land of Israel, it can mean the earth. It's our word, earth. Aretz, earth, you see. And, uh, but Tevel is the earth we walk on down here. That's planet earth. Uh, Malayim. There's another word for words. Malayim. And th to the ends of the earth, the Human speech reaches malayim, the words discussing them. Malay, Malone is a dictionary, and so forth. That's the words to put together. All these words. And then there's another sentence, Seth. L'shemeth, sam, ohel, vacham. And out of these things, out of these words, this is sounding very Kabbalistic here, and out of these words and out of these notes, he has constructed a hevel, just ohel, that simply means a tent, but it doesn't mean a tent. It means here... The, these communication, by these communications, he's just talking about communication. Words, he uses four words for words and for hearing. And by these communications, he has provided a frame of reference. That's what an ohel is, a tent that's set up, of course. And ohel, frame of reference for the sun. See, the sun is not everything. It's in the closed system here, too. The sixth verse is a typical hymn to the sun. It sounds like relativity. Uh, the sun rises and sets and so forth as it goes through the sky and it's sort of... Well, it does, you see. Relativity is correct. Now, the na nautical almanac, if you're amateur astronomers, you have to use the nautical almanac all the time. It tells you the time the stars rise and set and the sun rises and sets so you can find your way at sea. But anyway, it always talks about sunrise and sunset. Well, how unscientific. The sun doesn't rise. Oh, yes, it does if you use the nautical almanac, if you refer from the place you stand. Now, seven times in one chapter in the book of Abraham, the Lord says, this is as it is from the place where thou standest. It's with reference to your standing place only. With reference to where I stand, the sun rises at a certain hour. I can take a walk 10 steps to the east, and it'll rise earlier. I can walk 10 steps to the west, and it'll rise later. You see, that's all I have to do. The instruments are sensitive enough for that. The same thing if I go north or south. It depends entirely on where I stand, but the sun does rise and the sun does set. That's for us. See, this is a form of this anthropism. Anthropism is man. The whole structure depends on our viewpoint. And you can't view it now, not without being affected or without affecting it. That's the surprising thing. Well, let's see what else it says here. The, uh, uh oh, I lose it now. I have to come around here. Now, what does the, nice, the, the next one say? The, yes, uh, <clears throat> the Torah and the law. Now, comparing the laws of nature and the laws of science by which the world is governed. Oh, we, oh this next verse is a beauty because this takes us right. This takes us something that wasn't supposed to have been discovered until the, until the 12th century, the tabulus maragdina, which is called the mystery of the kaf and the mystery of the o, the great o and the great kaf, the great circle. And here it calls it the kaf. An amazing thing, kaf is the, is the Arabic letter kaf, but it's not the Hebrew letter. See, it's the interesting thing. It goes back to the old kaf. What it says here, uh, to the ends of the heavens, 
Moto, uh, he has brought forth Wu to Kuvato and his great calf Al Katotham Wain with. And his, what is this thing that comes to the end? I don't know what it calls it in the King James. Somebody has, have your King James here? What does it call it in the, now it's in this, it's in the seventh verse. What's it in yours? Where it starts out from the ends of the heavens, from the heavens of the heavens, Motze, Motze, U, the sent forth. The the, what? The circuit. The, the circuit, aha, uses the circuit. And here it uses the word tekufoth. The word for circuit is the word calf here. That tells me a, a great deal. We won't go into that, but that's an amazing thing because see, calf is, uh, this calf is uh, not the Hebrew letter. It's not written that. Well, it was once. The archaic letter was that. But that's what it's talking about. The cycle, the, the calf. Uh, al Kasotho to its end. Uh, and then it says, the law of the God, the law of God belongs exactly in the same system. It belongs with this. The Torah of the Noi, Tamim, the law of God is Tamim, perfect. Per that means a, a complete circle. Job was an upright and a perfect man. Doesn't mean he was the greatest who ever lived. It means he completed the circle. He did all he, he should do. Tamim means a complete circle. It's used in it's an Arabic word, the same thing, Babylonian, the same thing. Tamim is the complete circle. How big does a circle have to be to be a perfect circle? Be any size you want. The idea is that it's the form and it's a closed circle. It's closed and, and it has to be equidistant from the center at all points, you see, and then it's a circle. But that's the word it used, but the law of God is tamim, it's perfect in that regard. Uh, Meshivat means repeating, bringing to, bringing to repentance, as a matter of fact. Uh, tamim meshivat, panas yes, nafash. Bringing, bringing to the nafash, your spirit, bringing to the mind, bringing to the spirit a reminder of its true nature. The, the uh, meshivat, you know what the meshiva, that's the atonement, that's coming back again. Meshivat, a bringing to the mind of its true nature, of the nefesh, the meshivat nefesh, the bringing the spirit back home, is what it is, what we call at one minute, coming back again, you see. What a thing. Uh, meshivat nefesh, edot, well, then the, the edot, the knowledge, the knowledge is plural, the knowledge is of God, of, Yeh of Jehovah, are using the same word as amen. Netmanab can be absolutely secure. You can say amen to them. You see, when you say amen, you must say amen. That's part of an ordinance. When somebody prays or when the sacrament, people don't say amen anymore. And you must. That's required because you, you don't approve. You're not participating if you don't say amen. Amen, amena. It's our word is mind, mean, remain, and so forth. To mean, to mean confirmed. Confirmed, be steady, stay where it is. I confirm that. Amen. And you should say amen. Amen is a Latin term. You, you think it's highfalutin to say amen, but Latin is a Semitic term. And the other is, is, is amen, not amen, but amen as we say it. Amin, well, amin, of course, never. Uh, but uh, mono is the word, uh, and the knowledge of the Lord is most certain. Mechima, uh, there you are. Mechima which is wisdom of a direct and simple sort. You can't argue with it. This, this pathi means the simplicity of a child. Remember, the Lord comes to the Nephites, the first thing he wants them to be like children. He said, but he tells us this is, this is, uh, uh, yeah. pathi, the making of the wisdom and the simplicity, with the simplicity of children. What a thing to say. Then the ninth one, and it brings conviction with it. they. Illinois. It is, oh yes, it is, it is the conviction of God. And it is the, uh, oh, Yeshira, uh, Yesharim, which is, is true, upright, perfect, and proper Yesharim, of the righteous, Mistamin, uh, from the, the secrets of the heart. Oh, Mismache, Simach, Mismache, Lev. It protects you from all confusion. The idea is that this guarantees all you have to do is think about these things and the clarity will come forth to you directly. Relax and let it work on you is what, what he's telling here. Adonai. You see, uh, to hurrah, the purity of it. He says, you know, uh, well, the tenth verse example, the fear of the Lord, yitre adonai, to hurrah. The fear of the Lord is pure, straightforward, is, is purity, etc. All methods. The God. The eighth, 
Mishpate, Adonai, Emeth, the laws that God has set down are true, and they are consistent. Tzedaku, Yehadao, they're all the same together. Yehadao, they're, they're consistent with each other. You can test them that way. And as they tell us, you never ask anymore whether a, uh, a thing is true or not, but whether it's consistent. Does it, does it work? Some very striking statements here on that, that sort of thing. And then, consistent, and then, it is desirable, it is lovable. Nachmed, the same word as Muhammad there. there. But Nachmed, Mizhav, uh, uh, well, from the love, it is like desirable gold, is what it says. It is more, de more desirable than gold, actually. It is more, the word is actually lovable. If you remember, Brigham Young says you should seek knowledge because you love it. You could seek truth because it, because it is lovable, because it is desirable. That's why, not because it'll get you something to eat, he says. Or it'll bring you a higher income. He says, forget that. That's the word it uses here. It, it, lovable, it is more lovable, more desirable than fine gold, and more than uh, paz is highly refined gold. Uh, great hamitoka, as great as its sweetness, great as its sweetness than, than honey, and the runny Honeycomb. They use the word, no faith means to run, where the honey runs out of the honeycomb. It's sweeter than that when you're sucking a honeycomb, you see. Well, gum, just a little more here now. Uh, Moreover, thou hast admonished thy servant, and thy servant is admonished by these teachings. We are admonished by these teachings for our own lives, you see. He's been talking about the cosmos, now he's talking about us, you see. By him. Uh, which more I'm in keeping, and that in keeping these, in observing these ordinances and commandments and accepting these facts, there is a reward. There is a great consequence will follow from it. See, uh, akav, akav means consequence. They, I think they render it reward. Well, that's a consequence. If you follow these things, these admonitions, they're clear from the Lord. You know them directly. They're sweet to your taste. Remember Joseph Smith says, how do I know that's true? Because it tastes good, he says. If it tastes good, you can tell. A thing will hit you directly if it's true. He says, it tastes good. And he tells us here, it tastes good. It seems I, I must have neglected this little psalm because it, uh, it's got everything in it, you know. It's amazing here. And then the next one, Shagi Oath, me yavin uh, unawares. Miss Taroth Satar, she is a secret satra. It's, a, it's the same in Egyptian, same in Greek. Satra means secretly unknown, kept caught off guard, and so forth. Uh, the Kani. The Kani. Well, now, this is said uh, here. The word Shigi Oath is tripping or slipping. It's a, it's a skipping step. It's a dithyramb, actually. Uh, Miyavo and Yavio. The whoever slips or makes a mistake in it unaware will know clearly where he stands, is what it actually tells us. What does that say here, that 13th verse? That whoever slips or does this un in. Yes. Mi yavin means to distinguish, to know, to understand clearly. Yavin means to exercise intelligence. Mi yavin, unawares, who has, he will know, mispain, the things he has done aware will be clear to him. That's what it means. If you've made any mistakes that you're unaware of, uh, you'll be cleared by them. What does it say? Does anybody have this? Yeah, what's the 13th verse say for him? Well, I think it's the 12th verse in here. Well, it's 13th here, but it's the same verse, obviously. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret he cleansed thou me from secret faults. There you are. Secret, it's not secret faults, but it's unintentional faults. They're hidden from. A satra is to hide. A satra, in, in Greek, it means a, a hidden ulcer, a sore, something hidden. Uh, it cleanses me from things that I have committed unintentionally, as far as that goes, uh, rather than hidden sins. And then the biggest sin, the next one, is gum, uh, mizadim, pride. This is pride in. Um, Kashok in darkness, pride in darkness, thy servant, uh, oh, it's not Hashok, it's Hasok with an S. You have to make the same thing, actually. Uh, you, you will deliver your servant from pride uh, by this rule, and uh, in who, uh, as since he is Etam, Etam again means clear, standing alone, means standing alone and independently. A, a Yatim, Arabic is 
is a person with no support, no family support, no family or anything. He's an orphan. He's a yatim. That's the same word here. A, a tam means uh, as a tam u naki ti naki ti. Thou wilt purify. Thou wilt purify me. Min peshag rav from many peshag, many sins, many from a great sin, from a great sin. Thou wilt purify me from a great sin. That must be what it means. Uh, that he stands free from a great sin. Uh, and then, uh, you, the Ratzon, and they shall be for a favor, uh, the utterances of, of my mouth. Notice the words of my mouth. He actually uses the words of my mouth. Uh, you, the words of my mouth shall be for a favor, actually. Wahagion and my utterances of my, the utterances of my heart, the instincts of my heart, if they before thy face, O God, O Jehovah, so re my help, my rescue, and my redeemer. He ends that way. But the, the point about this, when we untangle it, is that it takes us right into the midst of things here, as the scriptures do here. Look at Mormon does. You just wait. We'll see about that. Uh, now, the supreme example of this anthropic principle of the unity of everything is in this seventh chapter of Moses. Notice the expressions he uses here in the 30th verse. Uh, the particles he uses of millions of verses like this. And thy curtains are stretched out still, and yet thou art there. See, there's, there's the anthropic principle. You're, you're stretched out still, and you're there. Wherever you go, you are there. And thy bosom is there, and thou art just. You are there even to your bosom. Then he goes on, the 24th verse. And Enoch was high and lifted up even in the bosom of the Father and the Son of Man. Well, what are these? They're all fused in one single, in one, embraced in one single. You don't say system because there's no end to it and embraces everything. This is right in line with what they're talking about. In these days, huh? And yet thou art there, and thou, and thou art just. <laughs> 31st, thou hast taken Zion to thine own bosom from all thy creations. See, all the creations are there. They're all one. He can take one out from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity. And we're going to have it endless here. I can stretch forth mine hands, 36th verse, and hold all the creations which I have made, and mine eyes can pierce them also. A little while ago we said, well, that's absurd. How can the same man who walk around here be doing all that? See, this is something. But this is the way it works now. We shall see, I suppose. Uh, the whole heaven shall weep, and when one, one world has to be destroyed, the whole heaven shall weep for them. All the workmanship of my hands, which you said he'd made them, they all weep because they all had a share in it. They're all together. You can't separate one from the system. Well, I'll have to find some of those passages. There's some very good ones here. Uh, but just a second, I will. Uh, the whole heavens, all the workmanship of my hands, wherefore should not the heavens weep, seeing that these shall suffer? See, every world contributes to all the other worlds. They all have to each so that no two worlds are alike in that way. An infinite number of combinations are possible. It's not monotonous, in other words. And it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. Each one emerges out of the others and shares from all the other, with all the others. Uh, and notice, never in all the scriptures does the Lord ever imply or say, there are no creations but mine. He never says that at all. He says, these are my creations, this is what I do, and so forth. So let's see what we have here. Oh, now, Hawking, on page 125, says here, the development of life, uh, well, we're continuing for something. It seems clear that there are relatively few ranges of values for the numbers that would allow the development of any form of intelligent life. In creating the world, as various scientists have recently observed, there are innumerable ways in which things could have gone wrong, but only one way in which they could have gone right. Well, somebody must have. That's, that's against all laws of chance and probability and everything else. It's one to infinity. It shouldn't happen accidentally. Hawking finds in the 128th chapter, uh, page, he says, he finds it hard to credit the strong anthropic principle that this whole vast construction exists simply for our sake. Well, it doesn't. There are other creations. There are worlds without number. But it's also for our sake, because we're in it. He goes on, there does not seem to be any need for all these other galaxies. No, not for there was nobody on them, you see, as far as that goes. Nor for the universe to be, and this is equally amazing, so universe and similar in every direction. Those other worlds are universe, are uniform and similar 
as in the other worlds we have heretofore formed. Everything follows the same pattern. It doesn't make them monotonous, but the point is, all the same substance, all by the same principle. And he says those two things are absolutely astounding, that there should be all these other worlds, as far as we know, there may be any, anyone in them as far as that goes. But then along with that, that they're also uniform, all made of the same substance. The possibility of other worlds almost certain by billions of other galaxies, and the second is that it's the same everywhere like unto other worlds I have hitherto created. Is it monotonous? No. They're all alike, but they're all different. As he says, it, each one comes out of all the others. They share the common existence. We just read those passages. They weep because they all had a share in the creation of each. There is no end that we can see to them. And this is again what Hawking writes, quote, the quantum theory of gravity has opened up a new possibility in which there would be no boundary to space-time. You see, from eternity to eternity, there's no boundary to space-time. The boundary condition of the universe is that it has no boundary. We're still quoting him. Saying, the universe would be completely self-contained and not affected by anything outside itself. It would be neither created nor destroyed. It would just be. Now, Sagan thinks this rules out God, uh, and he's greatly relieved. But we can never close the book on the picture. That's what it means, nor can we on the gospel. And then another one from, from uh, Hawking here. Any model that described the whole universe in detail would be too much too complicated mathematically for us to be ever able to calculate its prediction. So we're not going to find it. But th that doesn't mean we can't keep looking, you see. One has therefore, now this is what do you do in a case like that? To make simplifying assumptions and approximations. That's what we just read in this psalm here. That's a simplifying assumption and approximation, trying to say the same thing. But he says, if we're going to try to figure it all out in detail mathematically, it can't be done. Absolutely. Well, for us to be able to calculate exact predictions. Therefore, one has to make simplifying assumptions and approximations. And even then, the problem of extracting predictions remains a formidable one. Let's see what else we put down here. Now, third, third Nephi is like a, a thrust stage, like one of these forward stages, you know, with everything brightly illuminated and standing out in all dimensions. And this is in contrast to the flat, faded, ancient mural of the New Testament, which we think is in a two-dimensional thing. The Spirit doesn't just stand out that way. We have slighted the Book of Mormon. We prefer the New Testament. Statistically, overwhelmingly, somebody went through all the conference reports and see who quoted most from which. And by far the most quoted work is the New Testament. And the Book of Mormon is hardly quoted at all. Very interesting. General Thorley told me at the conference, the last one, where President uh, Benson introduced the, the keynote of the conference, the Book of Mormon, and after that nobody mentioned it. He said, typically we don't like it. Why? We prefer it because it gives New Testament, gives us more license and liberty to wax emotional, inventive, and sentimental, and, interest, and uh, interpret things our way. The Book of Mormon won't let you do that. He comes right down here. But wait a minute. When we want to make it live, we, we hire Harry Anderson or something like that, uh, the, some of the Adventist artist who's very literal. Well, that makes something. That won't work. Third Nephi, though vividly real, is low-key. It's the world as we see it. There are no special effects there. I say there are no Paul Lucas, no Steven Spielberg there at all. You expect all, all things to break loose. Nothing breaks loose there. Now, this is admonishes us, as we said, to look at the New Testament again, and we overlooked one of the best verses of all, and that's the, that wonderful 22nd chapter, uh, 21st chapter of John. He says, this is the third time the Lord appeared. And if you want literalism, listen to this. Why do they make John the most mystical? Because if they accept him for what he says, he is crassly physical, uh, as they put it here. And uh, a famous Catholic, uh, uh, Lapide, uh, famous Catholic, uh, one of the very most famous Catholic commentators, says it's an outrageous, insulting thing, what it says about Jesus. You cannot have it. But this is the way it goes. It's great stuff, I do think. This will go slower than that stumbling psalm. The psalms are very archaic. They're hard to read. Metatout, well, I haven't done it for ages anyway. Uh, uh, after these things, he, he showed himself again, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples on the seashore of Tiberias, the lake of Tiberias. And this is how it happened. And, the frozen dude, and in this manner, he showed himself. We begin. It happens that Simon Peter, along with Thomas, the one called his twin, and Nathaniel, uh, who was from Cana, and uh, who was Ca the Cana in Galilee, there were other Canaans all over the place, and uh, the two sons of Zebedee, uh, who were disciples also, uh, Peter said to them, Apago, 
Uh, how do you wait? I'm going swim. I'm not going swimming. I'm going fishing. Well, he did go to swim for me. He loved to swim. The earliest record we have, the, the Clementine recognitions, <laughs> tell us how when Clement met him on the beach, they were having a conference at uh, Caesarea, and Peter would get up very early in the morning and go down and swim in the ocean. Nobody else would, but he'd go down and swim and run up and down the beach. And, come down. and that's, where, that's where Clement met him. Uh, so Peter is a very rugged person, but Peter says, hey, Pago, well, I'm going fishing. Hey, Pago, how are you going? And uh, they said to him, well, we'll go with you. Uh, we'll go with you, and we'll all be together. Exhaleth and Kai, and so they all went out, and they went into the boat. And that night, when you fish by night, the guppies run better that time. That night, uh, they didn't catch a thing. When it started to be daylight, eight day gentlemen, when it started to be late, right, there was Jesus standing on the beach. It's a surprising thing. They didn't recognize it was just dawn. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Again, he's not appearing in chariots of fire or clouds of glory. Just an ordinary man standing on the beach. And uh, they didn't even recognize him, just like Mary, they thought he was a gardener. And he called out to them and he said, Pethia, that means fellows, boys, Pedia is the way, uh, uh, an affectionate way a teacher addresses his students, just as a colonel in the Russian army calls his, to his men Dece, children, little children, Kinderlach, uh, Dece. So he says, Pedia, kids, boys, kids will be all right. Uh, have you had anything to eat yet? Pedia may prosphagian ekative. Had breakfast yet? Prosphagian, uh, anything to eat yet? And the answer is said, no. And he said to them, well, try, try casting your nets on the right side of the boat and uh, you'll find something. So they acted accordingly. They threw the nets on the right side, and uh, they had hardly, they, were, and they couldn't draw in the nets fast enough because they were full of fish already. They ran into a, a school of fish, in other words. And then the disciple who was with him, the one they called the beloved one. Now, is John being modest when he refers to himself always, never by name, but the disciple that Jesus loved? I think he's giving himself a medal every time he says that. <laughs> the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. He shouted out. And Peter, that is Simon, hearing that it was the Lord, turned into bunched up his, took on clothes and but hustled into his clothes. That's a good thing. Hustled into his clothes because he'd been naked uh, while they were fishing. Uh, that's exactly, that's a good word for it, isn't it? Uh, Ependutain, diadzosito. Ependutain, diadzosito. He hustled into his clothes and uh, what did he do? Jumped into the sea, uh, in the Sea of Galilee. For his naked guy, Evelyn had to and cast himself into the sea to reach the him at a distance. But the other disciples uh, wisely remained in the boat, he says, because they weren't very far from the shore, about, uh, about, 200, uh, about 200 cubits, which was almost exactly 100 yards. They were just 100 yards out from the shore. So Peter was a great powerful swimmer, you see, and he jumped in first. He doesn't say he walked on the water on this occasion, but he jumped in first to get to the Lord. He could do it. He could beat the boat. You see. So Peter was a top man in more than one thing, you see. He was quite an athlete. Uh, because they were just about 100, uh, 200 yards out. Uh, and they were, dragging the net, they were dragging the net behind them, of course. They were sitting behind them, the net of fish behind them, that would slow them down. So, uh, and when they finally reached the land and, and uh, got out of the boat, Blepusin and they saw, uh, Anthrocon means a fire of charcoal, that a fire had already been built on the beach and Jesus had already fried some fish for them. <laughs> Now this is altogether too much to take. That he should, uh, that Jesus should make, a, that the apostles should meet with him around a smoky fire on a sandy beach and and eat a picnic, a, a beach picnic of uh, broiled fish that the, Jesus had fished for them because they hadn't fished for them because they hadn't had breakfast yet. Now can you get more down to earth than that? You see, they said this is possibly insulting. <laughs> he shouldn't do this. Is this the King of Glory? Uh, and then he says, what do you say? Uh, they, they saw the, the Anthrocian, the, the, the coals burning, came in, and the Opsarian and cooked fish were lying upon them and bread. He had it all ready for them. And Jesus said to them, the miracles of loaves and fishes again, only he fixes them this time. And then he says, to Opsarian, Hote, Episet to noon. Well, he says, and then come, come up here uh, from the Opsarion, the, uh, from which. Uh, that is emptying. It's emptying the nets. And, and Peter came and uh, he drew, drew in the net uh, onto the shore and it was so full of fish that it broke. 
uh, and there were 153 fish. Now, this, everybody at this 153 see, uh, sighs an enormous sigh of relief. That must be a symbolic number, they say. This is, doesn't really happen. This is a mystery, you see. Therefore, because it told us the exact number of fish, just showing what a good catch they had, this proves that we're in a mystical world, you see, as far as that goes. And we're not, this really didn't happen. And Jesus said to them, Dota Aristasa. Now, he couldn't make it clear. He says, uh, come and have breakfast. Dota Aristasa, breakfast is served, or when has come up and Aristo always to have breakfast. It's very funny, but in the first lesson of White's grammar, the most elementary Greek grammar, that's one of the words you learn in the vocabulary. Aristoian is to have breakfast. And uh, there was one precious sentence in an old grammar in which the student has to translate, we love to destroy the queen's girdle during breakfast. Now, that makes no sense, but it exercises your vocabulary. <laughs> it's rather a silly thing to be doing, destroying a queen's girdle during breakfast. <laughs> but he says, don't our to come up and have breakfast. He says, that's exactly what he says to them. Uh, well, and uh, none of them dared to, to ask him questions, see, exitase, uh, and they didn't dare to ask, who are you? Because, well, they should know, you see. It was, and they saw that it was because they saw that it was the Lord. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, dare. And Jesus came and took the bread, and it gave, gave it to them, and just as if it was a sacrament, you see, the Malachan, and the, the, the upside, the, the baked fish at the same time. And this was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples uh, after he had risen from the dead. And this is the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and when they had eaten breakfast, he said to Simon Peter, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, of John, do you love me more than these? Well, he starts talking to them there. But now, look, what could you ask more than that? You see, we're, we're coming really down to earth here. And so, uh, the... Uh, oh, yeah. Now, some pious commentators, I say, like the great Lapide, find it revolting and shocking. So, all week now, I've had visits and letters and complaints and calls, and people find themselves perplexed, as if their minds were darkened or something. What distresses them is that nobody else, nobody answers the que questions, and we'll touch these things with a 40-foot pole. They're coming up now with the story of the creation now in the Sunday school. You see, everything's creation now. This takes us back to some very elementary questions. They, they don't like to hand them. They're usually, if they ask somebody, they're turned off or even rebuked by some local authority the stake present or temple present, tells them to accept and not make trouble for themselves or others. That's no good, you see. But if scientists can live with such galling limitations, and as Hawking says, we're going to have to live with them forever, we've just got to make our simplifications, we'll never be able to solve it as far as that goes. Why can't the priesthood do the same? If we shed our vanity, the limitations aren't galling, but they're delightful. There's work to be done, great problems to get with it. Unexplored territory is always the most exciting. Uh, now, here, Hawking says a very interesting thing here. He says, we have seen in this chapter how in less than half a century, that's since I've been at the BYU, in other words, man's view, really, man's view of the universe formed over millennia has been transformed. Even Einstein's general theory of relativity cannot tell us how the universe started off because it predicts that all physical theories, including itself, break down at the beginning of the universe. But this breakdown didn't cause the physicists to resign in disgust, though the head of the Department, physics department at Harvard in 1928, and the famous story is told a lot. He told the students that it was all over, there was nothing else more to do. Just as Professor Lindfuss, my professor in Berkeley in Greek, uh, told me there was nothing else to be done in ancient history, it had all been done, we knew everything that happened. Actually, he told me that, he was the top man in the country in that field. But it spurred them on to quantum mechanics. This is what happened, something else. Uh, and Two interesting facts emerge here on one page. He says, first, the laws of science contain many fundamental numbers. They're constants which can be learned only by observation. We can't invent them. We can't discover them by thinking. Nobody knows why. It is also possible that some or all of the numbers vary from universe to universe or within a single universe. It's possible that they may not have the same constants that we have. What is most remarkable and commented on with wonder by everybody is and he says, the remarkable fact that the values of these numbers seem to have been finally adjusted to make possible uh, the development of life. 
And then he says it seems clear, as he mentioned before, that there are relatively few ranges of values of numbers that would allow any form of intelligent life. Everything could have gone wrong. It just has to be certain numbers everywhere. He says, we don't know whether they apply in other universes, but we know there are other universes, and yet we know they're all one, we know they're all together. Well, all this thing is really quite something, isn't it? And uh, so we should get back to Third Nephi. But Third Nephi is the greatest revelation we have of this. This makes everything come out now. It, we shall see that. Read it again. Remember, 17 chapters devoted to the mission of Jesus among the Nephites here, after the resurrection, which is something. 